It's time to talk some shit on the Pal Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, Angel Collinson is my guest. And if you don't know about her, well, where have you been the past few years? Angel is one of those people who seems smallish and doesn't look like the badass that she is. But then you see her ski. To me, she's the one skier where when you watch her part in a video, if you don't know who's skiing on screen, you assume it's a guy. At least I used to do that. And now when I'm watching a TGR video, I sometimes find myself asking if that's Angel on screen when it's just a random dude. Where I'm going with this is you can't really tell gender from Angel skiing. And that's awesome. Angel's never been the token female. She's the one that shows up at her first contest, wins it, and then takes the tour title for two years in a row. She's also the one who starts to film and becomes the first woman to open a movie part in years. And then the following year, she becomes the first woman to close a movie part in years. Angel Collinson sets the bar at a different level. And before we talk about that, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. Share my posts on Facebook, which not even my mom seems to do. So I doubt you will, but I might as well ask you to do it. One day it'll start happening. And finally, I want to thank my sponsors. They are Evo, Rescue Water, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Outdoor Research, and Spy Optic. Now, let's talk to Angel Collinson. It's early on Saturday morning. What did Angel Collinson do on Friday night? I went to this Girdwood Town fundraiser. They're trying to fund an economic study to see if Girdwood should basically ruled under Anchorage or like under the Anchorage municipality. And they think a lot of excess money from the town is going to Anchorage. So they're wondering if they should succeed. Anyway, so they're trying to fund an economic study. So there was a fundraiser last night. So that's what I did. And is that fundraiser like a fun fundraiser where you're drinking beer and having a good time? Because it sounds kind of serious. It actually was fun. I wasn't sure what it was going to be like. And it was a pretty healthy mix of young people and old people and It was casual drinking, like apps, but more just to like bring awareness to what's going on. And yeah, it was actually pretty fun. I was surprised. And how long have you been in Alaska? I've been in Alaska now for just over a year. June is when I moved up last year. And you're already getting involved in the community events and trying to make a difference within their community or your community now? Well, I'm trying. It's cool to be part of a small town and instead of a big city, you feel more connected, I guess. So, yeah. You were in a little bit of a small town. I know you had a city down below you, but didn't you grow up in a small town? Yeah, I did. Like, I grew up at Snowbird and Alta. It was different because, well, A, I was, I was a kid growing up there, you know. I didn't really live up there as an adult. And B, like, we lived at Snowbird, which kind of was a town, but not really Snowbird isn't technically a town. Alta is technically a town. You know, they've got their own post office and stuff, but I bet they're ruled under the municipality of Anchorage in a lot of ways. You know, Girdwood's 2,000 people, so it feels a little more like an established self-governance in some ways than my experience was at Snowbird. Like, in Snowbird, I was still really connected to everyone that lived up there and the employees and everything, so I got that experience, but I guess... Being more involved with like the political workings or underbelly of what's kind of going on in the town is a new experience for me. Where you're living now and where you grew up, your whole life, everybody knew exactly what was going on with you all the time, I would think, because it was such a small community. Did you feel that? Yeah, there is similarities in that way. But I feel like with social media now, it's kind of changed things because now, like, depending on what I post... I still have a bit of control over, but a lot of people know what I'm doing every day. So it's sort of like I live in a small town in my everyday life, everywhere I go, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Because when you started skiing, social media wasn't as big as it is today. But now you've got a lot of sponsors and people want you to tell them what you are up to. And sometimes it's not comfortable sharing all the bullshit that you're doing in your life, even if your sponsors and people want you to do it. Are you comfortable with that? I would say it's one of my greater struggles just with my job and also with life in general. I think social media is so counterintuitive to what it means to be a human. (laughs) Like we're meant to be 
surrounded by people in communities having real eye contact or conversations or different types of more material exchanges. And the whole like digital realm is so crazy to me also because you can totally manicure your persona in some ways. Like you still have control over what you put out into the world. And my hope is that I can express myself as authentically as possible. And that's kind of been my guideline. And so the biggest challenge for me as an athlete isn't so much sharing my life because I don't mind sharing my life. I'm that kind of person that I really like when I ask you how you're doing, like, I really want to know, like, I want to know the nitty gritty details and I don't mind sharing them either. So that part doesn't bug me. But what's harder is kind of being like a billboard and having to post about products or for companies like because that feels inauthentic to me. And it's true. Like I'm with all of my sponsors because I love the brands and because I love the product. So like trying to make that connection when they're having these like campaigns where everyone has to do this mass push at this designated time, like that's really hard for me. And I don't know anyone who follows my account. Like I'm so bad at that. Like I post once every like two to three weeks and it also, that's not good with the algorithm. Like it kills your engagement and you kind of get punished and not as many people see your photos, but I struggle with it a lot. It's, it's sort of my like keystone struggle, I would say. In the digital realm, you kind of mentioned that you can do it, but we are meant to have more physical in-person relationships with eye contact. And that makes me think, have you ever had like the app Tinder on your phone? No. <laughs> You've never done anything like that? No, I haven't. I'm sort of curious about it, but actually not really at all. There was a period when I was single for like, before I met my boyfriend, I was single for a few years and it just was never appealing to me. We don't need to talk about all your digital life now because we'll talk about growing up in snowboard employee housing. That's a different one than any skier really has. I mean, a lot of people have grown up as ski bums, but when you think of ski bum, and you hear employee housing, I mean, I don't think it gets any more ski bum like that where you probably have two (laughs) parents that love the sport and eventually work their way up and probably have good jobs in the ski industry. But when they have their first child, you're in a a little tiny room, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the joke because I say it a lot, but my dad still jokes that we're just coming out of the closet because we shared a five by 12 closet until I was... 18 or 20. Yeah, almost until I was 20. John and I shared like this five by 12 closet that we put two queen size bunk beds in and a couple of dressers. <laughs> was life comfortable other than that? I mean, maybe that was comfortable too, because it's all you knew. But I mean, did your parents have any kind of money as like a little kid? Or did you think about anything like that? Or did it just seem like a normal childhood? No, it definitely did not seem like a normal childhood. I wanted a normal childhood a lot during certain points because, yeah, we grew up, my dad especially was like, we're not cheap, we're frugal (laughs) because we lived as a family of four off of dad's seasonal ski patrol job. And my mom taught a one-room homeschool for all the kids that lived up the canyon. There was seven total, but she didn't really make any money doing that. So it wasn't really a source of income. And then we rented our apartment out in the summer and traveled in the van. Literally the last day of school, dad would pick us up in the van and then we would return back to Salt Lake like the day before school started. So he didn't work in the summer and we never went out to eat. We never went to the movies. Like if we got straight A's on our report card, we would go to Taco Bell and get like 50 cent tacos. I think (laughs) like that was like the celebration. Like, I've never been to a fair, never went to Disneyland. There's a lot of things that sort of you would think of as staples of being a child or growing up that I never really had. And now I don't regret them at all. I Like, my lifestyle has made me and John who we are and and my parents and the way they chose to raise us. But there was a lot of times as a kid we're like, I just want to go to the pool and jump on a tramp and, like, go to the movies or I I don't know, all of these things that I I didn't have. And so it was definitely in our faces a lot. Like I didn't see a kid all summer. You know, we were backpacking in the high alpine all summer. And so I didn't really get that social element. Yeah. So there's like a lot of things in our face constantly that 
we didn't think it was the norm, but also, like you said, we didn't know anything else. And so while you sort of long for other things, the grass is always greener and you can always be happy with where you were and what we were doing was amazing. So it definitely fostered like a love for nature and outdoor stuff, you know, and now look at where John and I are today. So it puts you in a great spot, not saying that you couldn't have gotten to that great spot other ways, but thinking of how you are going to choose to live the rest of your life. Say in a couple of years you have a kid, which maybe might not be your choice or whatever, just hypothetically speaking, when mm-hmm. you raise your children, are you going to give them more experiences like the normal kid? Or are you going to give them more experiences like the kid who grows up in Snowbird and then travels the second school ends? Yeah, that's a good question. And one I think about a lot. Because it's hard to be a parent. Like kids are not really motivated to have the discipline it takes to become good at things, really. You know, like some kids are really driven at certain things, but maybe don't want to do others. Like maybe they're really good in school, but they don't want to go outside. Or maybe they love being outside, but they don't really care about their grades or whatever. So like trying to have the discipline to learn all the different things and and dip your toes in all these different waters, whether it's like sports or instruments or whatever, and trying as a parent to kind of hold your kid to the coals and and have them be disciplined, but still maintain the love for a lot of different things, or at least see where their interests are by forcing them to kind of try it or start it. Like, I think it's really hard. And when I think about what I'm going to do as a parent, like, I'm not sure because there was a lot of times growing up that were really uncomfortable and hard and you know like I didn't really get a good sleeping bag until I was like 13 or 14 and I was always cold in the summers (laughs) John had a better one but you know we just like all our stuff came from the thrift stores and there was just a lot of luxuries that we didn't have but I think it's made me appreciate so much more what I have now but it kind of sucked A a lot of stuff kind of sucked as a kid or at least was uncomfortable for example I don't really like to spend my free time hiking or like I feel like I would probably love to tour a lot more than I do right now if I wasn't forced to spend my summers the way that I did. Yep. And that one is hard for me because I so bad want to love hiking uphill and camping and and backpacking. But to be honest, I do everything but that now. Right. So I don't know. And like one thing that I really wish I would have been able to do was learn an instrument. And so I don't know. I hope to find a middle ground. And I definitely am so grateful for the way my parents raised me. And I don't criticize them at all. You know, I'm just like, I think I would do it a little bit differently just from my personal experience. But like, I also know that all kids, for the most part, don't really want to go hiking and don't really want to go outside. So like, where's the line of disciplining them to get off their phone and get outside? And then where do you say like, okay, that's enough. You can also do other things. I don't know. My family's very intense and like all in and like 100% on stuff when we decide to do it. So we might be on like the extreme end of the spectrum. So you never played Super Mario Brothers? No. Well, John did get a Game Boy who gave it to him it was a really large deal we're not allowed to play it very much but yeah we didn't have like a video game console or anything like that but you did have some amazing mountains right in your backyard and ski racing was huge for you in the beginning and that was another thing like I really didn't want to ski on the race team and my dad was like when I was eight he was like just give it a try for maybe a day or a it was either a day or a week or something. And he's like, if you don't like it, then you don't have to do it. And it probably didn't hurt that I had like a really cute coach that was super nice and friendly. And he was just awesome. He was my coach for a few years. And I came back, I'm like, dad, I want to race. So yeah, it was big for me. I, until I was 18, that was like kind of everything. I think whether it's like, I don't know, ballet or different sports, I can only speak to ski racing, but it's very, very consuming. So you sacrifice like a lot of life experience so that you can be dedicated to that sport. So yeah, it was like kind of my identity until I was 18. And I would say it's a little weird to me because I look at you now and I didn't know you as a kid at all. And I don't really know you that well now, but I know you a little bit. And I think that you might have like a little hippie to you, maybe even a lot of hippie. I'm not really (laughs) sure. 
<laughs> but I would think there's no hippie in the race world. When you are talking about shaving seconds off your time and you want to be the best and be the fastest, it seems exactly the opposite of what like a hippie mentality would have. And was that weird to you of trying to be the best when you were younger? I would say I've probably become more hippie in my older age <laughs> um, as I've grown older. But I am a perfectionist almost to a fault. Well, actually to a fault. I don't think perfectionism really serves many of us because it usually causes us to beat ourselves up or not start creative processes or whatever. But my mom calls me the technician. I really love like dialing things in, getting them super precise and perfect. Like when I draw a line, I want it to be straight. And so that part of racing of just like being that technician where you're trying to like perfect the turn and like how can I make these like minute improvements and then when you have big breakthroughs like that I love that and I've always had that with skiing where I'm always wanting to be better always wanting to be the best I can be I don't really care about being the best in the world that's never been my goal with anything. I just want to be the best I can be. And I know that I can be pretty good at certain things. And I know my specialties and I want to play to those. And so that was what racing appealed to, which is a large part of who I am. But yeah, it definitely was at odds with the more like exploratory, quote unquote, hippie part of me, (laughs) for sure. You didn't have fish in your headphones as you were racing down the mountain back then? No, I think I had like the offspring and sublime and that kind of stuff okay i'm gonna take a quick break and talk about my sponsors my first sponsor is evo and if you haven't shopped at evo.com or been to one of their stores in denver seattle or portland you are missing out on the best retail and online experience in the country The stores themselves are created to be a gathering place, an art gallery, a movie venue, and a travel base with the goal of making your adventures more fun. On the web front, Evo offers a low price guarantee, free shipping on orders over $50, and a no-hassle return policy for everything ski, snowboard, bike, skate, lifestyle, and outerwear. On top of that, for listening to the show, they're going to give you an additional 10% off your entire order. When you check out, Use the code capital TPM, the number 10, all one word, and you will get that 10% off your order. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and they are proactive recovery. What does that mean? Think of it like this. When you need a pick-me-up, you drink a soda or a cup of coffee. But when you really need energy, you grab yourself an energy drink. Well, with Rescue Water, it's a similar principle. When you need to hydrate, like when you finish a workout, get done practice, or get off the mountain or trail... Skip your sports drink and drink a cold rescue water. There's no better choice for replacing electrolytes, and it's a difference that you can feel. I like to drink a cold rescue water before bed after big nights out, and it's a lifesaver. Make rescue water work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com and save 20% on a 12-pack case by entering the code R-E-S-Q water T-P-M. That's all one word, and you can find that over at rescuewater.com. And I'm happy to bring on Outdoor Research as a sponsor to the show. I've been wearing their products since I moved to the Northwest in 2000 because it works better than anything else on the market. And they're a Seattle company. OR is committed to improving your experience with exceptional products so you don't have to think about your gear when you're out on your journey. It's not always going to be Bluebird. It's not always going to be deep. But with OR, it's always about keeping the stoke level high and putting exclamation marks on your experiences. When you're shopping for outerwear this winter, make sure you head over to OutdoorResearch.com and get 15% off your order with the checkout code POWELL15, all one word and in caps. Those are my sponsors, so we'll get right back into it. And one thing that's unique about you, too, you kind of touched on it earlier, is that you were homeschooled in a school of like seven people. And I think you're really smart, especially school-wise. I, for some reason, I think you almost had like a 4.0 or a 3.9 or something like that. yep. (laughs) 3.98. So you weren't as good as you could have been. But how was being homeschooled with seven people? Because I would think that there's no team sports or anything going on like that because school's in a little room. It was so amazing and also so hard. Like it's such an intimate environment. And I really recommend to any parents that are thinking about homeschooling their kids. It was really crucial for me to hang out with other kids still. 
in big group settings, right? To learn like big group social dynamics. And so we would go to public school in the fall and then we would homeschool in the middle two quarters and then we would go back to public school in the spring. So that was the way we did it. So I was exposed to like the normal school system half the year. But for me, the big keystone of my social life was ski racing. So, you know, I had that from when I was in a ski group when I was seven. So pretty much from when I was seven onwards, even though I was homeschooled, I was regularly involved with like kid group activities. And that was so key. So as far as the social element, I think it's really important to maintain that and make sure your kid's exposed to that. It was so crucial for all of us. But yeah, as far as the school part goes, my mom is just amazing. Like she is an incredible woman. I hope I grow up to be half as amazing as she is. And she was what made our lifestyle possible. She taught seven different kids and seven different curriculums all throughout high school. And pretty much all the kids were like A students and went on to get full ride scholarships or partial or most of the way or whatever, like some sort of scholarship just based on academics. So it blows my mind to think of her ability to manage seven kids with whatever, five subjects and three different states. And like she grappled it all and somehow like conglomerated it into a day-to-day curriculum. Basically we're all kind of self-taught as well. And that was part of it was like, we grew up at a ski town. And so if it was a powder day, people are always like, oh, you homeschooled. So when it's a powder day, you can go ski. That's so awesome. And you're like, yeah, but it didn't quite work like that. A lot of times on powder days, like if we were behind, we still had to go to school. So it was kind of on us to keep up with where we needed to be in our curriculum. And since we had seven different curriculums, we kind of had to teach ourselves, and mom would like go on and help each person learn like from their textbook, from their school in their subject, what they needed to do. But anyways, it was just like this constant rotisserating thing. I still don't know how she did it all, but my mom was a huge part. And the, and the homeschool experience, I think what it taught all of us was if you were stuck on something, she might have to help four other kids before you. And so you were forced to really try and think through things on your own and, and teach yourself a little bit from the, textbooks. And also when you're in that one room homeschool environment, we got a lot of what a lot of kids don't get, which is like how to be a good human being or how to really support your community or family or tribe. So if like one kid came in and they were obviously upset about something, it throws off the whole energy of the room and like no one can work, you know? And so a lot of it was like therapy and mom's pretty much like the canyon therapist. Like if somebody's got something going on, they like go talk to mom about it. But it would be like, okay, like a group therapy session, like what's going on? And you kind of have to like work through your demons in front of six other people. And it was hard. And there was a lot of that going on, like talking about your feelings and what's happening. And and sometimes it's with other people in the group. And so you got to figure out how to communicate with them and talk about what was hard. And and we don't get that nowadays. It's like kind of crazy that we don't learn how to do that. And it's like such a basic human need. So yeah, that was a really long winded response. But you say we don't get that. But even like what I grew up with, I didn't get that either. Just based on I was in a class of 25 people. And there was no way if someone had an issue that we were going to discuss it, we were just going to make fun of them until that issue made it worse for them, it seemed like. Right. That's how it was back then. But when you're in a smaller group and everybody knows each other better, there's no way around not dealing with the problem and then working through it. But for you, ski racing is your whole thing. And your senior year, I think, is about the time that you should be named to the U.S. ski team. And I believe you're really close, but you don't get named to the team. Is that how that played out? Yeah, it was kind of interesting because I was all in. Like, I wanted to make the U.S. ski team. I wanted to race World Cup. I wanted to go to the Olympics. I feel like, or at least I felt like I had the ability and potential to do that if I applied myself. And so 18, I'm like, all right, I'm freaking doing this. And I worked really hard. And I skied the best I ever had in my whole life. And I was doing really well in the NORAM circuit. And I competed in world juniors in Garmisch, Germany, and only the U.S. ski team girls, you know, qualified for it. So I was traveling with the ski team that year a bit for that competition and other European ones. And even though I was doing so well, it was not making me happy. And I'd always thought like, oh, if I actually ski well, if I actually do as good as I can, 
I think we all do this in life. If I only blah, 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 then I'll be happy. But I really realized that ski racing was not making me happy and I was pretty burnt out on it and I kind of wanted to see what else there was out there. And so the ski team is pretty political and a lot of the ski team nominations are based on coach's discretion. And I had spent a bit of time with the coach that year and we didn't really get along. <laughs> I was still a free spirit and I, you know, I wore like free ride pants instead of race pants that would zip off, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But basically because of him, I didn't get picked and I had other world cup coaches calling me and being like, we're really sorry. Like we couldn't have any say in this decision, but we hope you keep racing And that meant a lot to me. But yeah, I didn't get picked and I walked away from ski racing. I had a full ride academic, so I didn't have to ski race in college. And it was the best thing (laughs) that ever happened to me because my mom and dad were like, well, if you get named, like you have to do another year, at least for your resume. So you like you've worked so hard and to have US ski team on there. And I was like, I don't know if I can stand doing it another year. So who was the guy that set you free? It doesn't matter. But it wasn't just that. They decided to try a different tactic and go name people that were 16, which usually when you're 18 is when you get nominated. But they decided to try out kind of what Europe was doing and name some younger girls to the team. But it ended up kind of flopping because that sort of dedication when you're like 15 and 16 and you're still in high school, there's a lot going on in your life when you're that age. And it was really hard on those girls to be competing and traveling at that level at that young age. Well, when you've put your whole life into this, and I know you're getting sick of racing and it's burning you out, but you have put a lot of time into ski racing, at least 10 years. And are you bummed when you don't make the team or is it kind of a relief or or how does that feel for you? Well, mostly it was a relief, but obviously there was also a lot of anger and sadness. Actually, just recently, I was at my naturopath and I went to a new naturopath, actually. That's one of those doctors that doesn't use medicine? (laughs) Well, (laughs) you could say that, I guess. But anyways, something came up and it was like a heartbreak around. And he was like, yeah, this is like this many years and this many months ago. And it's a heartbreak you haven't recovered from. And I'm like trying to think of all my relationships. I'm like, when that, I'm like, well, that was kind of, that was in the middle of this relationship with that boyfriend. And then I'm like, oh my God, that was the exact month that I wasn't named the US ski team. So I I think there's maybe some stuff that I haven't quite gotten over. And I think maybe it made me more sad and more angry than I realized. And I have to do a little bit of processing more on that. But when I think back, it was mostly a relief. But when now going into it deeper, yeah, when you spend your whole life working on something like, frick, that sucks to not have that validation. When you're good enough and you feel like you've done everything you can to make something and then a person stands in your way, I think that's got to be more frustrating than anything because it's like, hey, I've done everything I can possibly do and it's not good enough and there's no way around it. Yeah. So you get a full academic scholarship, which is amazing. It saves your family or yourself a lot of money over four years. And is it University of Utah you go to? Yep. Yep. So you go down the street, you're going about an hour from your house, max. Do you live on campus your first year at school? Yeah, your first year, I believe you're required to live in the dorms. I did, but I figured, you know, if you come from a little bit of a hippie background and you grew up in a school of seven, you'd find some way to be up in the woods, but you didn't. (laughs) We're not quite as hippie, maybe, as you're painting it out to be. Yeah, so I lived in the dorms. Was that like a total culture shock for you because you grew up in the ski resort areas and then you're going down to a ton of college freshmen, half of them are are ready to party their faces off and the other half are ready to study. And where are you in that whole mix? I'd already done all my partying. I was ready to focus on school. The ski racing that I had was so crucial. Like I was traveling all the time. For ski racing like I was gone all winter I'm so glad I was homeschooled because the amount of school I would have had to miss like you know that's why there's the winter school in Park City like competing at that high level and traveling as a kid trying to do well in school too it's so hard so I was gone a lot and I partied a lot <laughs> not that that was good or bad the biggest thing was you know moving out and not having to go home to your parents every night which was awesome 
But like I said before, it wasn't new because of all the traveling I did because of ski racing. So yeah, I was ready to buckle down and really just get involved in classes. So I'm glad at the way it all worked out. Yeah, I would say most people that grow up in mountain towns as well are able to grow up a lot faster because there is a party culture that goes with the sport. Yeah. Even if you're not a party type person, you're going to be around it regardless because that's how these sports are. And usually if you grow up in them, you can get the partying out of the way early, which makes a good transition to college and life because you don't have to go all in your first night out and end up in jail or anything like that. Yeah, totally. So school, you want to study environmental law is that the goal with college yeah that was the goal because i spent all that time outside and in nature i was like this planet is amazing and there's nothing really in the way of us just kind of wreaking havoc on it i'm not necessarily super liberal but i do have a really really deep respect for the land and the natural resources from you know growing up on it and i was just like Pretty much the only thing standing in the way of us wreaking havoc on it is, I guess, two things, our love and respect of it, and that we just feel in, that it's inherently wrong maybe to, to do certain things, and law, <laughs> policy. So I just wanted to get involved in environmental policy and hopefully integrate some more different worldviews. I wanted to somehow translate my love for the environment into the legal system. And that seems like a a total departure from your childhood as well, just thinking about working in the legal system. But skiing is still a big part of your life. And what does the turn from racing, how does your free ski life evolve from there? Because you really have nothing that you have to do on skis now. It's all things you want to do. And what do you want to do at that point on your skis? Well, at that point in my life, free skiing and like big mountain skiing, that was my free place. That was my like safe, happy place. Like I would skip out on training a lot, racing and ski pal. I always had this free ride spirit just from growing up at Snowbird and running routes with dad and stuff on the patrol. And so I loved that so much. That was my happy place where I could put my headphones in and just do tram laps, you know, where you like catch the same tram all day. And I am thinking now of like how strong I was then. I'm like, oh man, I need to get back there. I was in the best shape of my life. Like I probably was skiing better then than I was now, honestly, from all the work I was putting in. But free skiing was always my happy place. And so John was, he knew me because it was a departure to go to school. But at the same time, as my GPA, I guess, kind of speaks for it. I love learning. I was having a really hard time deciding which I was more, a student or an athlete. And I really wanted to go to Harvard for grad school. Like I always knew down the road, I'm like, I'm going to Harvard. And I knew all throughout ski racing that I wanted to be an environmental attorney, or at least that I wanted to go into environmental policy. Like that was my number two goal. And sometimes it felt like my number one goal when I was in school and I was having to make time for ski racing stuff. But John knew that I'm like this intense person that just like gets really focused on something and then doesn't think about anything else. And he was like, Angel, you're going to spend all your time in the library and you're not even going to go up skiing. Like you should sign up for free skiing comps because it'll get you out of the library and they're super fun and you get to listen to music and you don't have to ski in spandex and everyone's partying and it's just like super loose, fun environment. And I think you'd really like it. So I was like, all right. So I looked at the free skiing world tour and there's only like five competitions. And I'm like, compared to like 25 races that I would do the winners before, I was like, oh, it's easy. So I just signed up for them all. And it was just a way to get me out of the library. But even that winter with those, I probably only skied like six hours a week or less. Sometimes I wouldn't even ski on the weekends. I was just in school. Six hours a week at this point in your life. What was the most you think you ever skied? When I was ski racing? Yeah, or just any time in life. I mean, if you're doing six hours a week and it was very minimal skiing for you, was it 30 hours a week was a lot? Oh, well, what's like an average work week? About 40. Yeah, so maybe 50 hours, maybe more. I don't know. Like a lot of times it's bell to bell and maybe even more depending your skiing has been cut down significantly. I mean, like 80% of what you used to do is gone. Yeah, I went skiing from like pretty much nine to four every day, like every day, maybe taking a day off every two weeks or something, but probably not to maybe for an afternoon or maybe a full day once a week. 
And then you enter this competition world and you're not as versed per se on your skis as you used to be because you've cut out <laughs> a lot of hours. I was pretty out of shape, yeah. But you do well off the bat. Yeah, I did. I got a lot of help from people and it was a totally different experience. My first one was at Revelstoke, yeah. And I drove up solo in this little two-wheel drive Honda, like through this crazy snowstorm. I hit a deer. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> It took me like 20 hours to get there, driving over Rogers Pass. It was horrible. Then I like show up. I didn't know anybody. I just didn't know much about skiing and about free ride. And everyone was so nice. And they helped me out so much with bouncing off like line selection. I'm like, how does this work? Or how does that work? I kind of had a general idea, but people were so helpful. And that I think that was also like a huge part of being able to step in and do well. Now I'm going to jump into my second set of sponsors. And Spy Optic has been independent since 94 and taking a playful approach to everything they create. They're killing it on the innovation game with their new electrochromic one lens technology. If you haven't heard about the Ace EC goggle, it packs the power of three lenses into one by changing tints with the touch of a button. It's crazy innovation that creates one goggle for any light. It's the best goggle on the market, period. Check out spyoptic.com for all the details on the game-changing EC, as well as their newest athlete signature models. And for listening to the show, Spy is going to give you 20% off when you head over to spyoptic.com. When you check out, use the code capital TPM, the number 20, all one word, and you'll get that 20% off. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They are all about drinking beer outside and supporting snow sports and culture. And this year, they are doing something that no beer has ever done before. They are not only creating Pray for Snow parties in their pubs that are going to be like no other, they've also produced their own ski and snowboard film, Pray for Snow, featuring riders like Ben Ferguson, Eric Jackson, and Lucas Walks. For a full tour schedule and more information on the beers and the pubs, head on over to 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors, so we'll get right back into it. And what's the vibe like in big mountain competitions compared to the race world that you used to be in? So lax. It's hard to describe. Like ski racing, you're getting driven everywhere and chaperoned everywhere. Now there's drug testing. There's no drinking. The coaches are drinking and you kind of know they're drinking, but no drinking allowed, obviously, because we're underage, you know, but racing is just a very strict culture. Everyone's going to bed pretty early, waking up super early and free riding is just like a free-for-all, which was so awesome and so welcome. If you looked at like the movie Revenge of the Nerds, which you didn't because you didn't watch movies when you were a kid, but <laughs> there were the nerds, which sound like the ski racers, and then the jocks, which sounded like the big mountain guys, and there was a fine line between the different funds that each of them had, although the nerds ended up winning in that movie. It sounds pretty similar then. That, was, that sort of sounds like the difference between free skiing and racing. I look at the athletes on those tours, and they're pro skiers. You're a pro athlete, but you aren't a true pro athlete, in my opinion, until you can pay your way through life on money earned through the sport. You know, just being on the tour to me isn't enough. By doing well on some of these events, is that how your first sponsorships come to play, or is that later on in the picture? Yeah, that was how it was. I mean, I did well right off the bat, so that helped. Competitions are a good way to get a name for yourself. And I would agree on the professional athlete definition of being able to make a living for yourself. And so I won the overall the first year I competed. And then part of the thing that I won was the North Face Young Gun Award, which is the best skier under 21. And that is sponsored by North Face. So I think it was $2,000 cash and then maybe $2,000 worth of product from the North Face. So I started talking with them through that. And actually, I think Gabe Schroeder from Smith, bless his heart. Super Gabe. Love that man so much. Gabe, if you ever listen to this, I think you're the best. He listens. He was the first one to ever send me product. And it came out of nowhere. He got my address from somebody and this helmet and goggles showed up. And I was like, pretty stoked. You know, I think all of us remember like the first time that we get free product. and It was a cool moment. And so he kind of started the like, back and forth sponsor stuff first. But then I started talking with North Face because of the that Young Gun sponsorship. And then I ended up winning the overall the next year. And then 
I think the talks got more serious. And then maybe the year after that was when I got named to the global team. But it was all just from competing and doing well. So that first two grand that you win, you have to be shitting your pants. That's a lot of money for someone who doesn't make money skiing. Yeah. I kind of had that shit my pants moment in Revelstoke. I think I got third. I can't remember what the prize first was. I think it was maybe 500 bucks for third. I'm like, that's cool because I spent the last five years spending 30. I mean, I fundraised all on my own. Not all on my own. Like my parents obviously helped me get my shit together so that I could fundraise. But I pretty much fundraised my whole ski racing career because I spent more money on ski racing than dad made. (laughs) So I went from spending these exorbitant amounts of money to, yeah, like walking into winning money because I was doing well and getting podiums. I think you drop out of school or you take some time off after that second year where you take the tour again. Is that when you decide I can do this and I'll come back to school at a later point? Yeah, it was after my second year that I won the overall. I realized at that point, just from prize money alone, I was making more money than I needed to pay my academic scholarship. Like I was making enough for the tuition at the U. So I was like, well, I don't have to sign up for classes if I don't want to. I don't have to keep this scholarship. Like I don't need it anymore. And I sort of had this like aha moment because I was going to summer school as well. And it was, it was getting increasingly hard to balance school and skiing because then I started competing on the free ride world tour in Europe. So that was, you know, European travel. And I was just like, how am I going to balance this all? And it being, you know, an all in athlete, I couldn't do super well at both. So I had to pick one It is kind of what I realized. Sponsors are probably jumping all over you. You're like an all American girl who's got a unique personality and is killing it. So I'm sure those conversations are ramping up. And if you can pay for college off the money you're winning after two and a half years on the Free Ride World Tour, then there's a lot more money in the tour or the sponsors you had than I thought, which is great for you. I can't think of too many people who are just on that tour that can pay their bills, even people that win the tour most likely. But you're in a position where you're a very marketable person. You might not look at yourself as one, especially back then. But the brands see that they can market the hell out of you because you really are authentic to everything skiing. Your story's pretty amazing and you check every box. So I would think some more money's coming around. Now you're getting travel budgets to go to all these contests. So your ski life has finally gotten easier, I would think. Yeah. Well, I wasn't making that much money back then. The used tuition was nine grand, I think, or maybe 10 grand. Okay. It wasn't a ton. And I don't think my, my sponsorships were not that much. When I signed with North Face, I think it was actually after I had already decided to drop out. And that was my first like kind of substantial contract. It's still like, I think some skiers contracts started out way more and now have declined, but mine have just been increasing because none of my contracts were like that big to start out with. And I'm guessing you don't work with an agent, but maybe you do. I just started working with an agent two years ago, I guess. Because I just realized that when I was re-signing some of my big ones, I like I love the personal interactions and working with the brands. And I feel like I'm always thinking of like after skiing, what am I going to be or do? And getting these relationships with these people is really meaningful and I'm learning so much. And so that was always valuable to me. But then I realized that the personal relationships get in the way of negotiating. And I think I lost out on like a lot of money that I could have made if I had had an agent. So that's when I was like, okay, I guess it's time to get one. And also to try and help me manage my workload. There are a lot of phone calls and a lot of things that when you have an agent, you don't have to deal with. It frees you up. In thinking of the contest scene and your free ride world tour scene, I mean, there is a really negative that happens on your, your tour that I can't really avoid in our interview. You were dating Ryan Hawks. He ended up landing on a rock and he passed. And uh, while I don't think you dated a long time, I think there was just a connection there that goes deeper than than a lot of connections you had had, at least until that point in your life. Yeah. And that has to be like the heaviest shit. You're what, like 20 years old when this happens or a little older? 20, yeah. And it's probably your first love, I'm guessing, but I don't know. And you still have to ski a contest you you see this happen and then first you have to get a contest out of the way how are you able to even do that well the hard thing was that he didn't die then he was in critical care so that was where the struggle was it was like I could drop everything and go to the hospital 
the whole time I knew that he was in a coma. So I was like, it's not like I can do anything by being there. And I just knew him well enough that he would, this was like a really important competition for me in my career because it was going to make or break whether I went to Verbier, which was like one of both of our goals. And part of our relationship was, you know, being able to compete on the tour together and share successes. And it was just fucking rad. And it was so important to both of us. We talked about it a lot. And like my big thing was, I was like, my dad doesn't want me to be in a relationship right now. So, and he was like, okay, well then just keep winning. And then eventually he'll like me (laughs) because I like won a bunch of comps that year and I was skiing really well. So anyways, I just knew that he would want me to go stand on top of a mountain and think of him and send him a bunch of love and ski my best. And how'd you do that day? I mean, I won the comp. I think maybe I got second that day. And then I went to the award ceremony really quick. And then I raced down to Reno after that. Now that we're at a certain juncture, you've had a lot of time to look back and just see how that whole thing affected you and how has it impacted your life? Because I'm sure it's more than just that moment in time. I'm sure it changed you as a person. Oh, yeah. I think all of our most challenging moments are the most defining ones. Like we're so hard headed that we don't learn the same from like a happy, all good times, you know, like we're defined by our challenging times. And obviously it's so sad and tragic but at the same time like that's life we all are gonna fucking die every single one of us yeah and it's so crazy to me it made me realize how much we're afraid to talk about death we're afraid to look at death and look at our own mortality and look at the mortality of people around us so one thing that it did for me was it really changed my relationship to death and therefore life and i also hope to start making it okay to talk about death and not so afraid of it. And I think in order to be okay talking about it, you definitely have to do your own homework and process it so that you are able to talk about it, right? And sometimes we stuff our feelings away and don't deal with them and then we can't talk about it. So that's part of it. But it made me who I am, you know? It really deepened my relationship with life, my relationship with other people, It really caused me to look at how I'm living and relating and and what do I want to get out of my time here? Why are we here? (laughs) What's the point? We can die at any moment. So what are we going to do? You know, it's sort of cliche, but it made me everything I am. And so I'm so grateful. And I still feel like I see him, especially in hawks, right? Birds of prey. And I think a lot of people have that story of when somebody passes. And for some reason, birds of prey seem to like really pop up a lot. And we're like, I know it's them. (laughs) I used to do this thing where when I was going through a hard time, I would ask him for something and I would always get it. (laughs) It was four leaf clover or a shooting star or something. It was pretty magical. And then I realized that I was kind of abusing whatever was going on and that I was like, okay, I trust in life. I trust in the universe and you and whatever all this crazy stuff is. I know I'm going to be okay. And so I quit like being so needy and demanding. (laughs) But yeah, it's easier, I think, for me. Because I was more, my relationship with him was what it was. You know, it's a lot harder to see his parents go through it. Yeah. And I'm still really close with them. And I talk a lot with them. His sister just had a baby. So that's really exciting. But it's a little bit harder to get over when you're a parent. Oh, for sure. I acknowledge that part. We're going to move along. And first, before I even look at the Free Ride World Tour and you graduating to movies, what do you think about Tanner Hall joining it this year? Disclaimer. I don't really watch ski movies except for the premieres I go to, and I don't really follow stuff online. I'm really bad at that. My life is not in skiing. Okay. (laughs) So I actually didn't know that. Wow, that's really interesting. I think that's freaking rad. Yeah, they gave him a wild card, and I think he's pretty fired up. He's got a new movie coming out, and it looks like he's skiing better than he ever has. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Like everyone, it seems like, except for Tanner, who's doing this backwards, People come up in the Freeride World Tour game and they start to get noticed and then they leave the Freeride World Tour to go film with TGR or MSP or whoever they're going to film with. You ended up working with TGR and how does that whole thing develop? Because if you look at your career, it's really defined by your movie parts, I feel like. And there was a lot of skiing before that, but you have to look to TGR as that brand that it doesn't matter if it's guys, girls, anything, just your skiing in general and the way they showed it, it change the game I feel like thanks for that nice comment and about them yeah I owe 
my lifestyle to them. I've worked at it for sure, but like they've given me so much and I'm so grateful to them. So grateful because I could have had that same skiing or same footage and it could have been presented a different way. Like they gave me the opener, you know, and that was like unheard of. And then they gave me the closer the next year and that was unheard of for a female. And And I'd say you earned both of those. That's the thing. I don't want to say anybody gave you anything. Well, thanks. But I guess it takes both, right? Yeah. If if they hadn't done that for me, it would have gone down differently. So I'm super grateful for that. And yeah, I started filming with them in what, 2012? And then that was 2015. So it took me like a few years to sort of like figure out film skiing and skiing up in Alaska. But I just was with the most amazing people helping me so much, like Sage and Ian and Dana and and Dash, like all of these guys. With the whole like women skiing and women outdoors thing, obviously as a woman, I like I'm so psyched to see more women out there. And I have learned so much from the men and from not having too much pride and just being like, I'm fucking scared right now. I don't know what I'm doing or like whatever. I am open and honest with them and vulnerable and they've always been really supportive of me. And I'm so grateful for that. Like my skiing is so much a product of the male support that I've had. So shout out to all the men helping all of us women out there. You guys rock all the dads getting the daughters out and obviously all the moms getting the daughters out and all the women supporting each other getting outside it's all good we're all a team and I'm just psyched to see like all of this happening but yeah so much has come from the men in my life and I'm super grateful on these trips I'm guessing that 90% of the time you're the only woman on any of the trips I would think having another woman on the trip with you changes things up for you where the guys are very serious, I would think it's a lot more fun being on the girl shoots. It's a little bit looser, and then it gets serious when it needs to be. Do you notice a big difference when there's girls on the trip compared to when there's not, which is almost always? Yeah, it was kind of funny because I was the only one for a long time. And then Jill Gareffi, who was assistant editor for TGR, and now she's like assistant editor and field producer, total badass. She's like the nuts and bolts of what keeps the wheels on the bus at TGR. (laughs) No joke. Anyone at TGR knows this. She's awesome. And so she started coming out into the field a couple years in, and that was really awesome to have her out there. I always loved being with all men. I never felt like there was a problem with it, but having rad women out there just makes it that much more awesome. And so when I go out with women and on these women's trips, totally, I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that it could get better, but now it's even better because there's like obviously all the guys out there, but there's also more girls and it is way more silly, which like you touched on, which was very insightful. It definitely is like that. There's a lot more goofiness, which I wouldn't have actually thought. And it's still serious when it needs to be, but there's a lot more goofiness, which is really nice because I'm a pretty goofy person. The guys, is it all really, really serious? No, definitely not. I think that guys still mess around a lot, but guys are kind of more single task, single focus is what I mean to say. So like guys' brains like evolutionarily are designed to be more single focus and women's brains are designed to multitask a little bit more. So like I can be cooking dinner and talking to somebody and also paying attention to what the person in the corner is thinking about and wondering how they're feeling and then being like, oh, I didn't call mom all while I'm cooking dinner and carrying a conversation. Not to say that we're great multitaskers, but we're a little bit more designed to think and feel a little more of a lot of what's going on in the current situation. Just, you know, when we're hunting and gathering, like we've got to be watching the kids and doing the task at hand and blah, blah, blah. And so I feel like that kind of comes into play or I notice that sort of thing in the mountains where guys are very focused on what we're doing. And so then if there's not like a really immediate task at hand that we're trying to take care of, then there's a lot more goofing. But if we're like trying to figure something out, there tends to be a little less humor. Not that it's serious, but girls will be like talking about something serious and then we'll like somebody will be doing something over there. We'll joke around about it. There's just like a little more humor injected into a lot more situations. In all of this, do you feel extra pressure because everybody in the world has told you how great your segments have been? And now when you go out and you're filming, do you feel extra pressure like you're doing this for all women? 
Or do you not think about that? No, definitely not. Fortunately, I think that would be a really hard load to carry. I definitely think about, oh, well, what are people going to think? Like, oh, this line isn't gnarly enough. Or what are people going to think of this? That comes, you know, when you know how well you can do and maybe the things that you're doing or the way you're skiing isn't quite up to snuff with what you'd like. That I have more pressure on. But ultimately, I would say I'm more internally driven. So I'm more like, just like I was saying with racing and doing the best that I can do. I'm always kind of like, oh, like that line is pushing my ability or that line's not. And it's less about what other people will think. Like I'm never on top of a gnarly line. Like people are going to think this is rad and this might win line of the year. So I'm going to ski it. I've never been motivated by that kind of a thing, fortunately, which is why I think I've had very few injuries. And still, even the one knee injury that I had, it wasn't because of that and I wouldn't take it back. But I think... I don't carry that load of of women skiing, thank God. Do you think anybody stands on top of lines and is thinking, I'm going to win line of the year on this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that. I mean, because sometimes it crosses my mind, right? Sometimes I'm like, ooh. Well, it has, actually. I decided to not do a line. And my biggest internal motivation was like, that's probably the gnarliest line a woman's ever skied. And I didn't do it. It wasn't the right day. It was really hard to step away from. Yeah, so I think... If it happens to me, I would imagine it happens to a lot of people because I'm not very usually driven by that kind of stuff. I was going to talk about some more skiing, but I'm not. I was going to talk about you winning the cold rush. I was going to talk about the gnarly crash that you had that you got more exposure than anything you'll ever get in your entire life. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to get publicity <laughs> for. Year, but you fall once. And- Anybody can find that on the internet. And then you had a, a major injury as well, ACL, but she got through that. But I think one thing that's different with you than a lot of people is it seems like you like to keep your lives a little bit separate. When you're not skiing, your life has nothing to do with skiing. You're all about reading, outdoor sports, kayaking, rock climbing, and singing. And can you give us a little song? <laughs> Whoa, are you just going to throw me to the wolves like that? I am. I did it to Michelle Parker, and she played her whatever she plays and sang and it was amazing so I figured I might as well ask you to sing because I know it's something you like to do okay well I'll just sing two verses I won't sing like a whole song okay that works okay you never need nobody and you you never been alone and I'll try to get your attention but all I ever do is wrong. There you go. That was it. <laughs> that was awesome. Like Michelle, who I said, hey, sing, and I thought it wasn't going to be great. You are the exact same where it was much more impressive than I thought. And I think you should sing your own song for one of your segments one day and get some band behind you. And I told her that as well, because you really have a talent there as well. Well, thanks. I mean, it's so funny. I do this with skiing too, the self-critical. This is where I think to all of us perfectionists out there, it doesn't serve us. Like sometimes I'll get done with a line and instead of being like, that was so fun. I'm like, oh, I fucked up that and I fucked up that. Same thing like after skiing, I'm like, oh, well, I fucked up that part and that was horrible. And it really gets in the way of me like enjoying what I do. And so that's what I've been working on lately. It's not doing that. But yeah, I got done with that song. I'm like, oh God, that was Horrible. I'm bit, a bit, a bit. <laughs> I'm not doing that. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is Burning Man has been a big part of your life, I believe. I don't know if you went this year or not. Did you go this year? No. I'm a little, I'm pretty sad about it, but we don't have to talk about that part. Okay. <laughs> but that's like a big thing where part of your year you're spending thinking about Burning Man and how awesome it's going to be? No, actually, I don't really... Sometimes you meet people that go to Burning Man and as soon as they bring up Burning Man or found out maybe you've been like, that's all they want to talk about. And I'm very much not that way. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't plan out my costumes beforehand. It would probably be super fun if I did, but I don't. It's always like the week before I'm like, oh God, I got to go grocery shopping. I got to figure out what I'm going to wear because my life is very hectic and busy, but It has been a huge part of my life, and it's been really eye-opening. And I definitely think that it's something that everyone should experience once because there's so much going on there, and they always say you you get whatever it is you want out of it. 
So having really clear intentions, like I've seen so much cool art and amazing performances. And I think my favorite thing when you go is it's like everyone treats you like you're automatically friends. Like they'll stop and help you with a flat tire or whatever. It's like you all have something in common. And I don't know. It's just a cool feeling. So yeah, I really love it. And most of my friends are all people that have gone to Burning Man and that vibe of humanity being your friend is pretty prevalent in my friend group. Now I'm at the part of the show. It's called Inappropriate Questions, and I talked to one of your good friends, Hadley Hammer. Oh, geez. Yeah, I figured she knows you very well, and she would have some (laughs) questions for you. And she's super nice, so she didn't give you anything too terrible, I don't think. If she knows, it would be horrible if she did. Okay, what do you got? Okay, so let me cue up question number one. Okay, I could... (laughs) List a lot of inappropriate questions for angels who <laughs> spent a lot of time together. My first, though, would be what is the most embarrassing interaction you've had when it comes to your brother and you living in a very small housing unit growing up and both trying to sneak in or out? You guys lived in tight quarters. I don't know if he had girls or guys back at the place or if you had girls or guys back at the place, but in tight quarters, a lot of that stuff would be seen. What is the most awkward thing that happened in your childhood? Oh, Rick, I forget. I can actually swear. I'm getting really good at not swearing. I just have been substituting, but I forget I can swear on the show. Yeah. That is a hard question. <sighs> There actually weren't too many embarrassing moments because growing up like we did, not a lot of interactions with other kids, especially in the summer. We ended up being each other's best friend. And so we would help each other. When I started sneaking out when I was 16, he did not like it. He was kind of a goody two-shoes for like most of almost all of his teenage years. He did not approve of me sneaking out. And so I had to do it all on my own. And we had a dog that would like bark and wake mom and dad up. And I got in really big trouble, but I got away with it for the first while. Anyways, then when he got to that age and he started sneaking out, I was helping him out. And so we didn't really sneak a lot of people back to the place just because of mom and dad. Because you literally had to go past their bed in order to get to our room, like right by their bed. So there weren't many embarrassing moments of like having romantic interest there or I can't really think of like, honestly. You never walked in on him doing something that, not that he shouldn't be doing, but not doing when his sister's around? Um, no, I don't think we did. And all, cause all of the like minorly embarrassing stuff wasn't embarrassing for us just cause we were super close and like shared a lot, you know, like when you're living out of a tent all summer together, like there's just your level of embarrassing stuff kind of is a different bar. So yeah, I can't remember an embarrassing time with him. Maybe I've just blocked it out. All right. Well, we will jump into question number two. Question number two, I'm actually going to borrow from Elise Sogstead. And if Angel could describe the necklace shape that is she wears around her neck and if it's a version of embracing <laughs> feminism subtly or a societal need for change or if it's just a fashion statement. But she'll have to describe what the necklace pendant is first. <laughs> so what's uh, this necklace? <laughs> uh, there's this company that makes wearable vibrators. Whoa. Yeah, it's, like, really awesome. Basically, like, vibrators that you can travel with that are, like, very discreet. Maybe they're, like, a lipstick or it's a piece of jewelry that's just really pretty. And it has, like, a secret function. So, anyways, I got outed. It's actually gold-plated. Like, it's fancy and awesome. And, you know, sometimes when you have a boyfriend and you're traveling for months at a time, Or if you only have a carry-on, like you're not going to, you know, pack necessary items in your carry-on. So I have this necklace, which is awesome. So I'm going to have to stop wearing it now that the word is starting to get out, (coughs) ladies. (laughs) (laughs) But to me, it was always fun. Like, I always like little secrets that you have where you're like, oh, haha, this, like, I know this, but nobody else does. And that's kind of what it was to me. And I guess it's like a way of, subtly embracing my sexuality in my everyday life. 
is what it represents to me. So yeah, I just decided to tackle that one head on. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you wear a vibrator around your neck, which is strange. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't know it's a vibrator unless you have friends that out you on a podcast. But yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I'd never heard about wearable vibrators. I mean, I've seen some guys with like necklaces with big tubes of KY hanging off of it, <laughs> but I've never seen just a vibrator on a necklace. Well, you wouldn't know that it is, which is the whole point. And it's sort of an underground thing. It's not a very like popular thing. But this one company is just making really classy stuff. So, yeah. It's all about being classy when you're wearing your vibrators. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> all right. We're going to jump into our last question. All right. The final question for Angel. If she could describe the lessons learned from a tutorial video that she showed me when we first went to summer camp and what she learned the most from that video. So a band camp video that we are going to talk about. What about this tutorial video should we know about? Oh, I actually don't know what tutorial video this is. I feel like I need to like phone a friend and figure out what the heck she's talking about. A tutorial video. It was probably something super nasty. Do you watch a lot of super nasty things on the internet? I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> I don't. What else is the internet for? No, I'm trying to... A, a, a tutorial. Like when we say super nasty stuff, it's fine. We, we're kind of venturing into new ground here. When we say like super nasty stuff, did you ever watch Two Girls, One Cup? That kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. Okay. I watch like a lot of really, really inappropriate like college humor stuff. And part of it maybe is hanging out with guys all the time. Like... I can think of very few times where I've ever been offended. So my like inappropriate bar is set <laughs> maybe in too high of a place. I feel like sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. And I would say one of my superpowers is understanding where people are at. And it's really important to me to be respectful of people. And I really don't like making people uncomfortable. So I try and really balance like my inappropriate humor with knowing the audience and <laughs> not trying to push it too far for what the person is down with. But for the record, Hadley is quite inappropriate. So I'm sure she had a really great time throwing me under the bus. She seemed to giggle and laugh a lot. So Ugh. I want to thank you for your time. Your career has been awesome. I think the one thing that I've always thought about your career is, especially with the segments in TGR, was watching them, it was so amazing because – you couldn't tell if you were a guy or a girl. And I think that's the beautiful part about your skiing is there's no gender to it. It's just that's a badass skier right there. And that's why you opened a movie and closed a movie and were the first person to do that in a long time. And it'll be awesome to see what's next. And speaking of that, what is next real quick? That is a great question. In the immediate vicinity of what's next i am going on tour for two movies right i filmed both for teton gravity researches far out and then the matchstick movie all in was actually a product of us girls getting together and being like we just want to ski together we never get to ski together we're always separated by film companies or sponsors and we just want to do a project and it kind of turned into a whole movie and it's a co-ed movie which i'm really psyched about it it's not just women because it was important to us that it wasn't just an all-women ski movie. We just wanted it to be a movie that we all got to be in and where it's mostly women and it's shredding. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I'm going on tour for two movies. So that's going to be busy. And then this winter, I don't know. I want to take a ski vacation, maybe to Japan. I've only done that once before in my whole life that, where it wasn't like a photo shoot or a race or a film trip or where I was like on all the time. So I don't know. I got to figure out what I'm doing with my life and my ski career and how I'm going to like make a difference with it. And I'm ready for my ski career to turn into something a little more purposeful than just film trips, but I don't know what that looks like. So I got to like sit on that and figure it out. We will see you in Far Out or All In or both. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was super enjoyable. So that was time with Angel Collinson. And if you haven't seen her ski, Google her right now. She's gotten a lot of credit over the years, but she's not one of those athletes that's fully into self-promotion. 
If she wanted to be bigger in the ski world, she could be, but it doesn't really seem like she wants to be. I mean, she moved to Alaska, and other than sponsor obligations and ski trips, I think she lives a pretty normal life that doesn't revolve around skiing. It's not all promo all the time for Angel Collinson. She lets her skiing do the talking. She has two movies out there this year, so there's a lot of talking to be done, and I encourage everyone to see both of those movies. And I really should have asked Angel if it was weird being in both a TGR and an MSP movie this year, as they are direct competitors and she is starring in both. And I wonder if that ruffles any feathers of the TGR side, as that's where she came up and now she's gone to the competition a little bit. Who knows? I guess it's been done before and it'll be done again. Anyways, I want to thank you for listening and ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. If you're on an iPhone, it's super easy to rate me and it only takes a minute. Here's what you need to do. Hit the podcast app on your iPhone or search in Apple Podcasts for the Powell Movement. Then click on those amazing graphics that my wife created, scroll down to where you see the stars, and touch your finger on the five star and you are done. You can review me too, but that is going above and beyond the call of duty. If you're on an Android, I have no idea what you should do, but please do it, and if you figure out how to review me, please send me an email with step-by-step instructions. That would be greatly appreciated. Finally, I want to thank my sponsors for making this show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Outdoor Research, Spy Optic, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.